I'd like to stay here longer than man's allotted days And watch the fleeting changes of life's uneven ways But if my Savior calls me to that sweet home on high I'll live with him forever in glory by and by Welcome to the Casita Road Church of Christ and a worship to God this morning. We are happy indeed that you have tuned in and we look forward to a day of worship. And in this worship, studying the Word of God, remembering Jesus in his resurrection when we partake of the Lord's Supper. And in so doing, he is part of our lives every day. And we can always say that God is good to us. And we are thankful indeed. Today we want to take a look at Luke chapter 23, begin at verse number 33 all the way through 49. We'll be looking at some things about Calvary or Golgotha, the place that is called Calvary. What an important place in the lives of Christians. We need to remember what happened there. We need to know its significance, not just a once a year event, but something that is in our lives day after day. The passage before us opens up on a hill in Jerusalem called Golgotha or the place of skull. Golgotha is a brutal, bloody, and horrifying place. These passages should break our hearts with grief and should wipe away the pride of our hearts. The songwriter puts it this way. When I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died, my richest gain I count but loss and poor contempt on all my pride. Golgotha is a place on which our lives should break and crumble, where Christ should become our all in all. You know, the Lord was called the man of sorrows because before even the cross came, he was rejected by his own home folk. His family said he was mad. The people of his hometown said he was a child born out of wedlock. They said all manner of things about him. Jesus was misunderstood. He was persecuted. He was ridiculed. He was threatened constantly by Herod, by the kings, by the Jews, by the Pharisees, by his neighbors, by all people, and even the very devil himself threatened him. As Jesus went about the earth, there was this cloud always above him. He was betrayed by man, by the nearest and dearest. He was indeed misunderstood. When he was being crucified, the Bible says that he was forsaken by all his disciples. They all ran away and fled. He was misquoted. He was misrepresented. He was lied about. He was mistreated in the courts of the land, and finally he was tortured, and then he was crucified. He was a man of sorrows, all right. He went through all of this. This is gentle Jesus, meek and mild that you know about, but perhaps you don't realize, my friend, unsaved and backslidden, you have forgotten what it was that Jesus went through. You have forgotten what, what it was for him to say, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? What it was for the Son of God who did no wrong for the Father to turn 
his face away from him in those moments of the cross and leave him. He says, waves and billows come over my head. I am sinking into the deep mire where there is no standing. Dogs encompass me. They, they, they gave at me with their mouths. They are like ravaging lions ready to tear my flesh. All humanity is around me, condemning me, wanting to rip me apart. Father, as if to say, why are you letting this happen to me? What's going on? You know what's going on. Or you should know at least. The word of God says that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. It says that the blood of Jesus Christ, God's son, cleanses us from all sin. His blood had to be shed. Because flowing through the veins of the almighty son of God was a substance. There was never a substance like it in, all, in the whole universe. It was precious. It was priceless. It was an eternal thing. It was something so special. It had so much power. It is the blood of Jesus Christ that sometimes make me want to sing. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. His blood had to be shed because flowing through that vein as we said before there was this substance called the blood of Christ and with this blood our sins are washed away. It is the only thing in the universe that can take away a man's sin. It is the only thing in the universe that can save a never dying soul, an eternal soul, from the fires of an eternal hell. It is the only thing. Prayers can't do it. Candles can't do it. Religiousness can't do it. Denominationalism can't do it. Morals alone can't do it. Politics can't do it. Only the blood of Jesus can wash away man's sin. Jesus suffered physically because his blood had to be shed. But he suffered spiritually there on the cross. You see, the Bible tells us that a darkness fell upon the cross. And indeed, all the land around it. There is something that went on there at Calvary and Golgotha's Hill. Not just the physical and emotional sufferings of the Lord Jesus, but something we can never understand. We can never plumb the depths of, uh, uh, estimate the, the vast volume of what happened on the cross, spiritually. We read in the book of Isaiah, listen, that God the Father laid on him the iniquity of us all. Isaiah 53, 3 through 6, he was despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he had borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgression. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds we are healed. And then he says, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. 
Do you know that? Let's get real today. Your sin, my sin, not the boy beside you. Your sin was upon him over 2,000 years ago. Jesus Christ, I want you to see this. If you see nothing else, see this. Like an electric parlor in the, in the countryside where all the electric lines uh, uh, converge into the current. He was there. The pylon for my sin. God directed upon him every sin of the world from the east to the west. North and south, every language, every culture, every creed, every country was directed to him. He was standing between heaven and hell. Was the way, the bridge, an arrow pointing to God. If man was going to know God, if man was going to have his sins forgiven, have a relationship restored that was broken way back in the Garden of Eden, he was going to have to come by the way of the cross. That cross, just like it was made out of a tree, would be the tree of life to every sinner. He hung there. He suffered there. And let me say this. He saw, he suffered the punishment of every conceivable sin that you could imagine. He was there on the cross. Listen, he suffered for the rapist. He suffered for the adulterer. He suffered for the self-righteous. He took the place of every person that has ever repented and come to Christ in the history of time. But the almighty thing and the wondrous thing and the astounding thing to me is this. When he was on the cross, I was on his mind. You know something? You might never have been told this. This may be a divine revelation to you this morning, but you were at the center of his thoughts too. Oh, there are millions of people in this world and no one loves them. There are street children in the streets of Ukraine and nobody would touch them. And every and the very Russian military shoot them down as if they were just in the way. They are cheering across the land and maybe you, you are one of them or were one of them in the past and you feel no one loves you, not a family. There are people like that, but no one can really say that no one loves them. I'm here to tell you this morning and I challenge you. You could be a father or a mother. You could be a son or a daughter or a husband or a wife. And you think that the love that you have within that family relationship is something that can never be exceeded, outweighed, or beaten. But I tell you that the love of Christ the love that he had for you to suffer on the cruel tree is more than tongue can tell. It is a greater love that you will never know. It is the greatest love that any human being of the whole universe can ever know. God says, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Do you know that? Have you ever considered him? The book of Hebrews exhorts us to consider him who endured such contradiction of sinners. Maybe you are seeing Christ crucified for you this morning. Maybe you are seeing for the whole that for the first time that you were in God's plan even before you were born. Or maybe you're like the man in the dream who was dreaming that he saw Jesus putting on the cross, or put on the cross, and the nails going through his hands, and the mockery and the scorn, and the whipping and everything happened, and he saw the soldier there nailing the nails. He ran to him in his dream, pulled his shoulder toward him, and then he stopped. And when the face turned round, 
it was himself. Do you feel like that sometimes? Do you see the blood of the Savior on your hands? I tell you that it's on your hands because he was suffering for you and for me. And he was suffering for all of us. There at Calvary. I'm telling you, can you see that it was you that put him there? It was all your wrong and all the things that you have done in the secret places. You think you have forgotten. But sometimes they come to your mind and out of the cupboard. The things that you wish you could bury, but like a seed, when you put it under the ground, it just shoots out and sprouts out. And then it bears fruit. You lie and you lie again to try and forget about it. To try and cut it never goes away. Would you not trust the Savior? Because he alone knows he can see all. He has seen all and he knows your guilt. But he died for you. And me, Calvary, Golgotha. Will you not forsake your sin because it was laid on him? Can you not see that it is finished? It's done for you. And all you need to do is forsake your sin. And obey that gospel of the cross. You don't need to add anything to it. You don't need to have to clean yourself up. His blood can do that. Have you ever considered him? It's on, the only way to be saved, my friends. Who would not rather this, the, the Simon the Cyrenian who was compelled to bear the cross? And yes, sometimes we have to quote the words. Must Jesus bear the cross alone? And all the world go free. No, there's a cross for everyone. There's one for me too. Remember that purple robe Pilate put on him. I was compelled to deliver him up the will of the, of the, of the, of the people. But apart from Pilate, that dastardly weakness, God has delivered up his son to the will of the people. When I think of this place, there's a conflict. Golgotha, Calvary's Hill, it's a good and it's bad. I am faced in full and the cause of my sin and disobedience is there. So, what about that, what about that place called Calvary or Golgotha? It is a place of guilt. Remember in verse 32 of our text, there were two malefactors with him. You remember the story, one of them was surely guilty of all, or both of them were guilty of all they were accused of, except for Jesus. Jesus was crucified between two thieves as if he were the greater criminal. Just imagine. Those two boys knew they were guilty, but one of them said, this man is not guilty. Jesus, on Golgotha's hill, paid the price for my guilt. Those who passed by looked at the crosses and could check them off by saying one, two, three. The Bible says he was numbered with the transgressors. But the guilt is not his. The guilt is ours. Why was Jesus crucified with criminals? Scriptures do not say, but perhaps this was a day set aside for execution. Or perhaps the Jewish leaders pressed Pilate to execute Jesus with the criminals. By this they hoped to add weight to their position that he was no more than a mere man, an imposter who deserved to die just like other criminals. Whatever the reason, the fact that the Son of God was executed right along with criminals add to the shame and reproach that he bore. My friends, Golgotha was a place of compassion. 
despite the fact that he was suffering. Listen to Jesus. Listen to him. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Could any human being maybe before Christ said those words with meaning? We know Stephen said them. But, before, but, but Stephen had someone to look to. Christ had no one but himself. Whatever man may do, whatever man had done before that, whatever man was doing at that time, whatever man would do in the future, Christ is simply saying forgiveness is available to every human being. It is important that we see this, that Calvary or Golgotha was a place of compassion. In our world today, compassion is so much needed. We are so angry every time. We are so confused because we have been mistreated. Because others are who, are, who, who, who we have depended on to be there for us have become disloyal. But Jesus said, Father, forgive them. What a prayer from a sufferer. What a revelation of love and mercy of God welled up through the breaking heart of Christ, his son. From the proud, guilty sons of men. He loved his enemies and he blessed them that cursed him. In this verse we see the power of forgiveness. The Greek text reads, after all this Jesus said, Father forgive them. For they know not what they do. After all this. When all this is done and over with. He can still say. Father forgive them. Aren't you glad that this is not a once a year event? Aren't you glad that this forgiveness is available every single day of our lives? Aren't you glad that Jesus Christ died? Aren't you glad that, my, that we can commemorate his death every single day of our lives by the way we live? Listen. When we think of what Jesus Christ said, Father, forgive them. These are some of the most powerful words of all scripture. After all this, what's this? Stand with me at the foot of the cross for a moment. Not this sterilized picture uh, that, we often put, uh, that, that we often portray, but the foot of a torturous device of capital punishment. Today the cross is worn as jewel hung in the homes, stands in church buildings and symbolizes freedom and beauty and hope. But this is not the cross that throws its shadows on Golgotha. This cross is an unimaginable brutality, a device of unimaginable brutality of torture and death. See Jesus, God in human flesh, hanging from nails driven into the hands of and feet. And see the crown of thorns pressed down on his head. See the blood dried and caked in his body from the brutal beatings and scourgings that has gone before. See the Messiah now bearing the full weight of the sin of the world upon himself and hear him crying out, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? You see, sin separated God from the, from the Son. Not his sin, but mine. Now you see with me his lips as they form the words. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. See through the ages, Jesus looks upon every lie that you have ever told. Every time you have cheated your boss, 
Every word of gossip that seeped from your mouth, every outburst of anger, every moment of neglect, every act of disobedience, every lost and squandered moment, and those words ring out clearly, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they're doing. He sees the things because he bore it all in his body. He on that cross to pay the price for what you purchased. Who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree. That we being dead in sins should live unto righteousness by whose stripes we are healed. Then let's go to cross for a moment as we come back later to finish. Then Jesus Christ was taken down from the cross, placed in a borrowed tomb. See Jesus in the tomb. Then see him that come early that Sunday morning, the first Sunday morning. When the angels came and rolled away the stone, and the songwriter was right when he said, up from the cross, he arose with a mighty Listen, listen, see him. That Sunday morning was with the most glorious morning that ever existed because the Son of God had conquered death from me that I could be alive today. And because he lives, I can live as well. What about you this morning? See yourself on Calvary. You put him there. But see the benefits of his resurrection. Because of his resurrection, I now can be a Christian. You believe in Christ? Are you willing to change your life in repentance? Confess your faith in him and be baptized. He wash away your sins. Make you what you need to be. What a change since Jesus came into your life. We extend to you an invitation if you're subject. Why don't you come as together we stand and sing. Softly and tenderly Jesus is calling, calling for you and for me. See on the portals he's waiting and watching, watching for you and for me. Come home, come home, ye who are weary, come home, earnestly, tenderly, Jesus is calling, calling, oh.